There we go. And I will let our attendees know that Carissa DeMore is here with us this evening and we'll get our presentation started. Okay, perfect. Well, let me just share my screen here for a second. Bear with me, everybody. Okay, all right. So, um, everybody, thanks uh, for, for joining me tonight um, to talk about energy efficiency and old houses. Um, it's a topic that I really love to talk about uh, because increasing the energy efficiency of older buildings is really a win-win-win. Um, it's good for the environment. It's good for preserving your community character, your sense of place, and it's also good for your wallet. So before I dive into that, um, really, let's start by having me tell you a little bit about the organization that I work for. Um, Historic New England is the oldest, largest, and most comprehensive regional heritage organization in the country. So as part of our mission, Historic New England saves and shares historic homes, open space, collections, and stories from the past to today. And historic places convey cultural memories, shared experiences and unique experiences that help us understand who we are. And they're often built with high quality materials and construction techniques that don't exist anymore. And they're great incubators of new experiences and, and continuing uses. You may have seen this if you visited uh, one of our public sites. Historic New England owns 38 public sites all along, uh, all throughout the region. Um, for instance, we have the Phillips House in Salem or the Gropius House in Lincoln. Um, you may have also um, looked at some of the materials in our online collections database if you enjoy doing research about historic places. Um, but we don't want you to just see the value of historic preservation when you come visit us. Through our work, we also hope to inspire good preservation practices beyond our sites and across the region. So my background is in landscape architecture and historic preservation. And I've been with Historic New England now for about eight years. Um, the team that I manage is focused on helping communities across the region and even across the country to preserve old buildings and landscapes. And we do that in a, in a host of different ways. Um, we mitigate change to historic places through some legal controls, through something called a preservation easement. Um, we share technical guidance based on Historic New England's 110 years of practical preservation experience. We provide educational opportunities about what makes uh, a building or a place worth preserving. And we strategically advocate for historic resources. So with all of those options uh, for how to preserve something, you might be wondering how Historic New England decides what to preserve and how to do it. So we make decisions about caring for historic resources using what we call our preservation philosophy. And it's a guiding set of principles that includes researching and documenting resources in order to make informed decisions about their preservation and their adaptive use monitoring historic resources to ensure timely maintenance and repairs that are really essential to their long-term preservation, choosing maintenance and repair treatments that prioritize keeping historic material, ensuring that those treatments also acknowledge and preserve the design and craftsmanship that created that historic place in the first place, sharing what we know with others, just like I'm doing tonight with all of you, and then also learning from others um, by following or improving on national best practices. So Historic New England's goals for our museum sites are probably different from yours as a typical homeowner, uh, but this philosophy actually provides a really solid baseline for museums and private properties to ensure that the decisions you make are made with the longevity of the resource in mind. And that brings us to tonight's topic, how to increase energy efficiency in your older home. As an organization that has spent over a century advocating for preservation of historic places, we know it's really important to show that older homes can be adapted to modern needs. 
in ways that are affordable, effective, and sensitive to their historic values. So one key aspect of that is to increase their energy efficiency. Um, making older homes more energy efficient is a really big topic. So I'm gonna break it down. Starting with why this stuff matters. Why bother making old homes more efficient? Then some simple things that you can do as homeowners or as renters and give you some tools so that you can weigh the pros and cons of common retrofits based on your home and your goals. And then we'll end with a case study of how Historic New England did this work at one of our properties and the lessons that we learned from that experience. So let's dive into that first section. If you ignore everything else that I tell you tonight, these are the three things that I want you to understand when it comes to energy efficiency and older homes. Older houses are not the biggest problem. Energy efficiency is not a new concept. And there is no one size fits all approach. Since you decided to come to this talk tonight, I'm going to just assume that you agree already that it's important to use energy efficiently. Um, that being efficient energy consumers is important at a global scale. Um, this chart actually shows data from the National Energy Information Administration. This is basically how the United States uses energy across different sectors. You can see that the building sector accounts for about 33% of US energy consumption. Um, and residential buildings specifically account for about 18%. However, old houses are not a big contributor to that 18%. So what is an old house? The National Register of Historic Places is the nation's official list of buildings, sites, structures, objects, and districts worthy of preservation. So that list requires a property to be at least 50 years old before it can be considered even potentially historically significant. So old by National Register standards means a building built before 1970. <clears throat> According to the US Census, 77% of the country's 140 million housing units were built after that point. In national register terms, that means only about 4% of national energy usage is by old houses. And raise your hand if you don't think that 50 years is old. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing there's a few. Uh, maybe for you, a house doesn't count as old until it's at least 80 years old. Um, in that case, only about 12% of houses across the country are 80 years old or older. That's 17.2 million really old houses that account for about 2% of total U.S. energy consumption. And all of that is to say old houses are not the biggest problem when it comes to energy consumption and knocking them down for new ultra efficient construction is not going to solve our global energy issues or our climate crisis. That said, New England has a lot of those old houses. It's really lucky for us actually. Um, between 21 and 31% of housing stock in New England is at least 80 years old. So it's worth thinking about how we as a region can increase the efficiency of these older houses. And even if you don't care about this global energy use stuff, uh, making your old house more efficient can actually save you some money and it could make you much more comfortable in your house. So it's still worth talking about. A term that gets used a lot when talking about energy efficiency is net zero. That means the total amount of energy used on an annual basis is equal to the renewable energy created. The carbon emissions produced are equal to the carbon emissions removed from the atmosphere. It's basically about balancing inputs and outputs. And net zero may be a great ambitious policy priority, but it worries me how often it, it gets misapplied to make homeowners think that they have to solve the entire challenge of energy use single-handedly at their property. I'll talk more later about deep energy retrofits that are designed to make houses achieve net zero. The concept of passive house is another term that gets thrown around a lot. 
Um, but for now, I want you to remember that I just showed you how our energy use comes from a lot of different sectors and efficiency is a systemic challenge. Building energy efficiency into your house is only a small part of that solution. Net zero isn't a feasible goal for each and every individual building. It's too expensive, it's too limiting in the kinds of approaches that, that it allows you to consider to achieve balance, um, which is why it's really important to consider net zero as a policy to be applied at a larger scale across your whole community. You don't have to achieve perfect balance at your house. Instead, multi-building systems, looking at lots of different properties, um, includes high and low energy consumers in your community. Um, it includes the new construction and the buildings that are really well suited to energy efficiency retrofits and buildings that are more sensitive or are harder to adapt. And so this allows a community to invest its energy retrofits where the return on investment is really the highest. And that multi-building approach also lets communities balance across different uses and different ways to adopt renewable technology, um, considering urban, suburban, and rural areas altogether. If you apply net zero thinking, building by building, property by property, basically you end up with low, low rise urban, uh, suburban sprawl. If you look at net zero on a community scale, you can preserve density, diversity in your building stock, and still balance energy use and offsets. And finally, if you look beyond individual buildings, there are other opportunities to increase energy efficiency through infrastructure improvements to things like water supply, wastewater treatment, the electrical grid, transportation management. So lots of possibilities open up. One of the ways that Massachusetts communities implement broader energy efficiency policies in a way that impacts individual properties is through the stretch code. Uh, the standard for energy conservation in new construction and remodeling is an HERS, a home energy rating system level of 100. HERS, H-E-R-S, is a scoring system to rate energy conservation based on a blower door test, a duct compression or a leakiness test, and other measures of home energy use. Massachusetts provides incentives to communities to set local standards below that 100 PERS level at 85, and that's what's called the stretch code, um, which is the level required for Energy Star new homes. So I don't believe that Wilmington has adopted the stretch code, but I still want to share a case study about it um, because you may still find um, it useful. So in 2009, the city of Cambridge put the stretch code to the test by rehabbing a typical three-decker to meet uh, the code's energy conservation standards. The building had an initial HERS rating of 143. And you remember, 100 was the higher level standard. Uh, so 143 is way above. They brought that rating down to 85 through the addition of R13 wall insulation. R30 ceiling insulation, and comprehensive air sealing. The energy upgrades to meet the stretch code added just under $15,000 to the overall costs of the building rehab, and they reduced annual energy consumption costs at that building by $2,700. So basically that study proves that old houses can meet these stringent new standards at a fairly reasonable cost. And this is really good news for those of us in the preservation field who think that older homes are worth keeping around uh, because it underlines the point that we don't need to demolish all the great old houses that we love here in New England just to meet new energy codes. So we've talked a lot so far about relatively new policies and initiatives but New, England, New Englanders have always been interested in energy efficiency and making their homes more efficient. That's because chopping wood and shoveling coal to heat your house is really hard work. So people have been finding ways to reduce their energy consumption for basically as long as houses were being built. And your house probably already has some energy efficiency built right in. 
Um, for example, very early New England homes faced south to make the most of sun exposure in the winter. Shutters kept that heat in overnight. They could also keep hot sun out in the summer. Some homes, uh, like you're looking at in these images, were insulated with brick nogging in the walls or eelgrass insulation. That's that lower left image. Um, low ceilings also kept heat closer to occupants. And then in the 19th century, double hung sash were invented and could open at the top and at the bottom. And this allowed for better air circulation in the summer. You open the top and the bottom and basically that allows warm air inside to move out through that, that top opening and cool air from the outside to flow in through the bottom. Later casement windows uh, allowed even more airflow in old houses and then radiators were positioned beneath windows to create that same kind of convection current uh, during the winter. And sash locks weren't just for security. Uh, they were used to keep windows tightly closed and to seal out drafts. Heavy drapes and rugs insulated and doors could be closed to keep in heat. Porches shielded windows from high summer sun and allowed people to live outside warm houses in the summer. Today, energy efficiency is a really big commercial industry and starting an energy efficiency project can be a little overwhelming. The home improvement industry would be very happy to help you make your house greener. Uh, home Depot, Mass Save, the Department of Energy, there are all kinds of places, but not all of these resources have historic preservation or old buildings in mind particularly. So for comprehensive information about home energy savings, I think energy.gov is kind of the best starting place to begin to educate yourself about things. But a caveat here, uh, keep in mind that a lot of businesses are trying to make money selling you new products. But in order to be an energy efficient consumer, you want to conserve as much embodied energy as possible. The embodied energy of an existing house is the sunk costs of material and labor used to create that building and to maintain it in the first place. So maintain your old house, it's the ultimate recycling. And when you're thinking of buying something new to make it more efficient, you have to keep in mind the energy that is wasted when we choose replacement over maintenance, when we throw away serviceable materials, and when we manufacture, ship, and install new products. So it's all about balance. And that brings me to my last point in the big picture. There is no one size fits all solution. In an old house, a one-size-fits-all approach just won't work. There are some best practices to keep in mind though. Um, keep your intervention simple and reversible. Avoid overly complex or costly solutions and treat very old houses. The, the, more, uh, the more history contained in your house, uh, treat it more gently. They're irreplaceable. Focus your more invasive interventions on newer additions, newer parts of your house. Old houses can absolutely be made more efficient, but we need to consider the house, its age, its use, what systems are in place now for windows, heating and ventilating, insulation. Every house requires a somewhat different approach to weatherizing. And that brings us to part two of our roadmap, what you can do. So while you want to be thoughtful about changes to old houses, there's still a lot that can and should be done in any house, regardless of its age or its historic significance, to make it less of an energy consumer. Start by taking advantage of those historic energy efficiency measures. Use your sash locks, close the blinds or the drapes, heat rooms differently depending on where you're at, where you're occupying the most, uh, the most of your time. Also think about your habits and expectations. Rather than heating your whole house to 70 degrees, maybe you put on a sweater. Next, consider the simplest interventions. Many simple things can be done by you for very little money uh, or by specialists at a pretty reasonable cost. Um, things like using efficient bulbs and programmable thermostats. Um, this low hanging fruit is gonna give you the best return on your investment in terms of energy savings. 
and those more expensive invasive solutions are going to be totally wasted if you don't, don't do these simple fixes first. So that means uh, the next step is to really look at air sealing, windows, insulation, and heating and cooling systems. So a great way to decide how to get the most bang for your buck is with an energy audit. This is a test of how leaky or drafty your house really is. A blower door in, in this kind of energy audit uses a fan to generate positive or negative pressure and it directs air out of or into your house, at which point you can identify leaks um, at logical entry points. Some of them you're able to feel, some of them you might be able to detect with something called a smoke puffer, and some, some energy uh, auditors will use an infrared camera, uh, which is the image that you're seeing in the lower right here, to show you where cold air is leaking into your nice warm house. You can see on this image, for example, and I think you're all seeing my mouse, I hope, um, that there are these dark blue spots here right at the corner of this window sash. Those are spots where we know the warm air is escaping out of this older window. So this graphic then shows you the kinds of places you would typically find those leaks. And once you know where the sources of air infiltration are in your house, you can fill them. And the fancy term for that, uh, the, the industry lingo, if you want to use it, is air sealing. So air sealing is an obvious improvement in preventing winter drafts, but it's also really good for air conditioning in the summer. Next, looking at windows. Um, wood windows can be a source of drafts, but you are, if you are among those lucky enough to still have your old wood windows, keep them, keep them, keep them. Um, unlike vinyl windows uh, or modern replacement windows, those old windows are built to be repaired so they can last and last and last. Um, wood windows do need maintenance. They can need things like paint or glazing putty, sometimes some carpentry repairs or general tightening up. Um, but you can also enhance their efficiency with weather stripping and you can consider adding storm windows to enhance their efficiency even more. So there are lots of studies that show that a well-maintained wood window plus a snug fitting storm window is as efficient as a double glazed vinyl replacement. Um, there are lots of different companies that manufacture pretty good storm windows for old houses, um, Allied Window, um, or there are several companies that make custom wood windows for exterior storms in New England. Um, the benefits of that are that they provide a really good air seal, they protect your historic windows um, from the elements, and there's not any major impact on the interior view of the window. Um, they can be more, more challenging to install though. So if you don't wanna climb onto a ladder um, to, to put them up and take them down, you might consider interior storms. Um, a couple of companies that make interior storm windows are a company called Interglass, which is based out of Connecticut, or a company called Indo Window, which is out on the West Coast, but manufactures uh, all across the country. And interior storms uh, also provide a really good air seal. They don't have any exterior visual impact to your home and they can almost disappear on the inside. Um, so this image on the upper right of your screen is showing interior storm windows. You almost don't notice that they're there. Um, and the lower left image uh, shows an exterior storm window on that bay. So as you can see, aesthetically, both options are, are pretty viable. Um, the decision for a lot of homeowners relates to ease of use and whether you plan to remove and store the storm or the screen panels um, during alternate seasons. So as with all energy efficiency upgrades to old houses, start an insulation project with the easiest project first. Um, it's relatively easy to insulate hot water pipes, um, your hot water heater, and seal and insulate ducts and cold air returns in the basement and the attic. Next, think about unfinished spaces that you don't need to heat or cool. Um, the attic is a great place to insulate. It can usually be done without being overly costly or invasive if your attic is unfinished, 
um, watch out for heat sources, things like chimneys, vent fan housings, uh, recessed lighting from below. Gaps around these kinds of elements should be sealed. Otherwise, a lot of the value of the insulating that you're doing will be lost. Um, bats can be rolled into regularly spaced openings. Rigid foam can be cut to fit. Uh, if you don't want to take up an entire attic floor or you have uneven cavities, which is common in older houses, um, dense packed cellulose can be blown into those spaces. Insulating your basement can be a more complicated process um, because your heating plant is often down there and there's generally also bigger moisture concerns uh, to consider. So the most valuable area to insulate in the basement is at the sill or the rim joist and around any um, penetrations, things like utility connections or ducts. So what about insulating the walls of finished rooms? Um, I'm, gonna make, I'm gonna make some enemies on this one potentially, but it's important to talk about. Um, when we did an energy audit of one of our oldest properties, <clears throat> this is the 17th century Pierce House in the Dorchester neighborhood of Boston we found that only 30% of our envelope heat loss was through exterior walls. 70% of the loss was from much more controllable locations like air leaks, the windows, and the uninsulated attic. So here's the pesky goat again. Um, whatever you may be told, know that introducing insulation into the walls of an old house is really complicated. It needs to be thought through. Um, active older wiring and walls retrofitted with insulation can potentially be a fire hazard, so that's something to consider. There are also some potential moisture issues to think through. So a colleague of mine spotted this Greek Revival house in Connecticut several years ago. Whatever wall insulation was added to this house, it is now harboring so much moisture that you can literally read the entire framing structure of the house in the mildew patterns on the outside walls. This is what preservationists fear. This is probably a 1970s oil crisis insulation job run amok. 40 years later, the house is well on its way to ruin, and it's certainly unlikely to be a healthy environment for the occupants. Poorly done wall insulation is also the culprit at these buildings where the paint is sheeting off the walls that are insulated. These days, blown in or dense pack wall insulation done properly does not have to result in these kinds of moisture problems. But managing moisture in houses where you're breathing and cooking and showering is a complicated piece of building science. It's easier to do when you have full access to wall cavities. Um, but for most historic houses, that involves removing either all of the exterior cladding or all of the interior plaster and woodwork. And at that point, you just have to weigh whether it's worth doing. Spray foam is a newer technology that is also advertised widely for insulation. And it is a really good insulator and it, it's also very effective at air sealing, at sealing those gaps. Um, and it doesn't absorb moisture. Before you invest uh, in, in foaming everything that you own, um, there are a number of things to think about though, of course. It can't be blown in through small penetrations. So in finished spaces, it would require wholesale removal of that interior or exterior surface fabric. It may require mechanical ventilation to maintain air quality if you seal up a really significant amount of your house. Um, spray foam also off gases when it's installed and it can release some pretty toxic fumes if you ever have a house fire. Spray foam hides what's beneath it. So consider the, uh, the impact on aesthetics potentially or on diagnosing issues. So for instance, if you, if you spray foam your attic and then you develop a leak in your roof, it's gonna be really difficult to tell where that leak is coming from. And it's also not easily removed. When it's in, it's in, and you're looking at a major effort to remove it if you ever want to. So those are some big downsides when you compare that to how much these insulation strategies will really decrease your energy consumption. And that this leads to the bigger point, if you get advice from a contractor that doesn't seem right to you, get a second opinion. It's just like going to the doctor, right? You wouldn't ever go in for a major operation if you had misgivings about the advice that you were given. Um, it's the same thing with an old house. A lot of contractors 
are not used to dealing with old houses, or they're trying to sell you something, or they only know one way of doing things, which may not be the right way for your house. So it's important to be a very active participant in those conversations. Electrical heating and cooling technology is increasingly popular as an energy efficient choice when owners hit that cyclic point of replacing their existing system. There are several different types with pros and cons. Um, even geothermal is a type of heat pump system. Um, air source heat pumps take heat from ambient outdoor air and they move it indoors. Cooling in the summer happens through the reverse process, extracting indoor heat and then pumping it outside. Um, many split systems like the ones that you're seeing pictured here, and if I can show you, this is an air handler, a condenser unit here. There's some um, connective uh, conduit up the side there, and then an interior um, unit on the wall there that we're looking at. Um, so these, these types of systems are a kind of ductless approach that can be really a very good option for historic houses. Um, you want to think through the location of those inside wall hanging units, and you also want to think through um, the location of those lines, whether they're run um, through the interior or on the exterior like you're seeing here, um, and what that, what that looks like. They can also be painted to match your side walls, which is really great. Um, you may be like me and have always understood that heat pump technology works best in moderate weather or as a supplement to traditional heating plants. Um, but actually, the technology is advancing really rapidly and becoming much more effective in New England's more extreme um, temperature swings. So that's really reassuring to hear. Solar is another relatively new technology that has been the subject of great debate in preservation circles. Um, I'm not an expert on the economic pros and cons of photovoltaic or solar hot water systems. But if you decide that solar makes economic sense, um, the next step is to have a structural engineer um, determine if your roof can support the installation. The weight of solar panels is not insignificant, and it may require you to enhance the framing in your attic to support a new system. You'll also want to think through whether your roof is in good condition. You, you definitely don't want to remove a fully functioning solar array to replace a failing roof. And there's a lot of debate about the visual impact of solar panels on a historic house. So to mitigate the, the non-historic appearance of solar panels, if that's something that you're concerned about, um, you can try to avoid installing them on roof slopes uh, that face the street. That depends a lot on the orientation of your house. You can also minimize their visibility by making sure that you have low profile panels that are installed flush against the roof surface and that the panels are all oriented in the same direction so they have kind of a uniform shape. More costly, more complex and newer energy interventions, things like wrapping a house with several layers of rigid foam insulation as they're doing in these bottom images, um, or installing uh, geothermal heating plants like they're doing up above. Um, these things tend to get a lot of attention. In preservation terms, deep energy retrofits involve subjecting older homes to a lot of experimentation in three critical areas, the materials science, the building technology, and the construction trades. So the highly engineered solutions involved in deep energy retrofits require really a sophisticated high level of expertise among designers and the installers of those systems. Um, they tend to be costly, both in terms of dollars and in the energy used to manufacture and install them. They have a lot of failure points, um, which means they may not last long enough to pay for themselves. And deep energy retrofits often include a substantial loss of materials and finishes that give your old house its history and its character. Dramatic reductions in energy consumption can certainly be achieved. But these retrofits are really designed with new construction in mind. It's really common actually in a lot of building code as well. Um, an old house though has very likely already moved, shifted, settled, sagged, and been altered. So it's not easy to square that circle. We need more information before I could ever recommend such extreme approaches to most homeowners. 
um, more research on the building materials side, a better understanding of historical methods and practices on the building technology side, and more training and specialized knowledge on the building trade side. Until then, my best advice for older houses is to keep energy interventions at a more basic level. Respect the core preservation principle of reversibility and proceed slowly. As we continue to enhance energy performance in newer houses, we will develop the expertise needed to safely, successfully, effectively, economically implement these solutions in older historic houses. We're just not there yet. So this begs the question, do the conservative approaches I've been recommending actually work? In 2010, Historic New England put these concepts to the test at the building I work in, the Lyman Estate in Waltham, Massachusetts. This is a house that was constructed in 1793. It had major alterations in 1882 and again in 1917. Um, in non-COVID times, it's used as offices and a functions rental site. Um, so it's not a museum, but it is a public site for us. And the approach that Historic New England took was to focus on reversible changes that were accessible to homeowners, um, minimizing harm to the architectural fabric of the house. And we also set a target for ourselves of reducing our energy consumption by 50%. So how did we do it? Well, using the concepts that I have been talking about tonight, um, we started with baseline measurements and metrics to figure out where we were at in the beginning. Then we addressed air leakage. We looked at insulation options. We looked at our HVAC system and utility improvements. And finally, we addressed some things in the lighting of the house. So does this look a little bit familiar? Um, we started with an energy audit to identify areas to concentrate weatherization efforts. Um, we also looked at how much oil we were using each year, 3,100 gallons, um, and how much electricity, uh, 65,000 kilowatt hours. And then we got to work. So we started by repairing and weather stripping all 120 historic windows. Um, that involved glazing, paint, structural repairs, and adding spring bronze weather stripping, which is what you're seeing down here in this, this lower right hand picture. We added storm windows, and actually we tried three different kinds depending on the location of the window and the use of the spaces. Um, the house now has exterior aluminum storms in some cases. These are set into the reveal of the window and custom color matched to the trim, so they're practically invisible. Um, exterior wood windows with uh, storm windows with swappable screen inserts for some of the offices, and interior compression fit plexiglass windows in some cases. Over time, the house had had a variety of new penetrations for things like plumbing and data cabling, and we sealed those with a reversible product that is unfortunately only available in Sweden, um, but there are other less reversible options in the US. Um, uh, side note, it's really important to air seal your attic before adding any kind of blown in insulation, or that insulation will fall through all of the holes and make quite a mess down below. When it came time to plan our insulation work, we knew that the attic and the third story of the Lyman Mansion were not occupied spaces, they were empty. So we chose to insulate across a continuous plane uh, just above the second floor um, that isolated the third floor in the attic from the conditioned rest of the house. And then we insulated by carefully taking up floorboards in that third floor space and using blown in cellulose. So this is that process in action. We changed our fuel source um, from oil to natural gas that allowed us to install a more efficient furnace. Um, and in fact, we actually installed four high efficiency furnaces um, and incorporated air conditioning into the house for the first time. Um, this also allowed us to upgrade to digital controls of our system, giving us a more nuanced control over the whole heating and cooling process for the house. 
So be aware that a high efficiency furnace requires special venting uh, because the vapor it vents is very acidic and corrosive. At the Lyman estate, we chose to remove and store a basement window at the back and install these PVC periscopes through that opening. Um, we were able to screen them with plantings and they could even be painted to match um, the colors of the house as well. The alternative to that option is to vent through your chimney. And in that case, it's really important you will have to line your chimney um, because of those corrosive gases. Um, poured in place cement liners are really irreversible and can cause a lot of damage to historic bricks. So I think stainless steel liners that can be pulled through, like you're seeing in these pictures, are really the best option for old houses. The house also needed a big overhaul in terms of its ductwork, um, which uh, comes up from the basement uh, to service the first floor and down from the third floor to service the second floor. Um, in the process, uh, we discovered that modern ductwork had been really poorly installed. Um, and in some places, it wasn't even fully connected to the vents. So we had um, ductwork running through the basement that was heating as much of the basement as it was the rooms above. Um, that wastes obviously a lot of energy, um, and sending heat where it didn't need to go. So um, this stage of the process, uh, in addition to fixing those kinds of larger problems, also involved more predictable activities like a lot of air sealing um, and insulating a lot of ducts. And finally, we converted our historic fixtures um, to LED bulbs. And this was done in 2010. Today, there are a lot more options um, to ensure a really good result in something uh, like, like updating your lighting. So did we hit our goals? Comparing our pre-project energy use to our energy consumption afterward, this project resulted in almost a 50% reduction in our energy usage. 47% specifically. Um, and the work was entirely consistent with our preservation philosophy and our aim to do things that an average homeowner could do. Um, a couple of other points that I would note, the results are entirely from use reduction. So they don't include any new renewable technology like solar to offset consumption. Not only uh, uh, was this a significant reduction in energy use, this also happened as our overall usage of the site increased uh, at the end of the project. So we began using the site more intensely. We had more wedding activity and things at the property afterward, and our energy use still went down. Um, however, as you can see, our efficiency did decrease a little bit over time. Um, basically, the novelty of the project wore off and staff commitment to efficient practices decreased. So you get things like bumping up the thermostat on occasion or not turning off lights as consistently. Um, and that's where you begin to see the, the shift in numbers there. So what are the big takeaways from all of this tonight? Um, old houses can absolutely be energy efficient and making them more so may save them from unnecessary demolition later. Start with good maintenance practices. Look for historic solutions and simple things you can do yourself. Choose low-tech, well-researched interventions. Prioritize reversibility. Weigh the benefits and risks of standard solutions carefully. And finally, don't underestimate how our behavior as human beings impacts the efficiency of our environment. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, there are lots of resources out there for folks who want to take a deeper dive into anything that I've covered tonight. Um, that includes the energy.gov website that I mentioned um, earlier in the presentation. Um, there are also a lot of great articles um, published by uh, a group out of Somerville called Building Science Corporation. And there are excellent preservation briefs published by the National Park Service about all kinds of historic preservation uh, topics. Um, and if you still need help that's specific to your house, Historic New England offers really detailed advice and guidance to historic, about all kinds of historic property ownership questions um, through our homeowner services, which you can access as a benefit of, of premium level membership with the organization. So if you're scratching your head about a really tricky issue, um, don't, don't go it alone. 
feel free to reach out to us and, uh, and definitely consider this as an option. And with that, uh, I will open it up to questions from the audience. We do have one question so far. Um, is it wise to have a home that is sealed tight? I happen to like my leaky home, which has 1600 bones and 1820 facade. However, with the climate change and the hotter summers, absent AC, I wonder about a heat pump and a field stone foundation capped with granite. Mm -hmm. So lots, lots of things um, in all of that. I think you can overseal your house. Um, and that's where you get into the, the kind of passive house concept. It takes a lot of work to overseal your house. Um, it takes a lot of interventions. Um, but it is possible to seal it to the point where you actually have to add mechanical ventilation systems to help with, with the air exchange um, for your own human health and safety. Um, from the things that I've recommended tonight, you're not going to hit that point, though. Um, so it's good to do things like um, air sealing. You, you won't you won't over you won't overseal your house by doing um, some some basic air sealing. Um, and and in terms of things like heat pumps or uh, any kind of efficiency upgrades uh, of that scale, it's a good idea to do things like air sealing along with those because it just adds to the overall efficiency of the house. Um, with things like foundations, looking at the at the pointing of your foundations, if you have a foundation with mortar in between um, your field stones, if it's a dry laid foundation, then it's a good thing to to have that looked at by someone who has some expertise in dry laid foundations um, to fill in the little gaps that develop there. Um, and then looking at things like sealing around uh, the sill or or the rim joist um, to keep uh, to keep the air above the foundation, essentially, it, the conditioned air in your house um, at a reasonable temperature. It's not usually necessary to insulate all of the walls of a cellar or a basement, um, if, that's, if that's something you're worried about. For the most part, those are insulated by the ground around them. And if you, if you insulate uh, the floor below your first floor um, and above your cellar, very often you're cutting off um, the little bit of energy that comes out of your heating plant if it's in the cellar and would migrate up into the rest of your house and you'll end up with a bit of energy loss there and also really cold floors on your ground level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the next question was, is it possible to install cellar interior storms with Plexi yourself, um, assuming that they don't need to be removed? Do you worry about condensation between the original window and the storms? So a good storm window should have weep holes in it. Um, and those are really important. So they're little tiny holes uh, at the bottom of, of the, the storm window that will allow for some air exchange and, and allow that, that vapor to get out because that is certainly something that you want to avoid is condensation between your storm, uh, storm window and your, your um, wood sash. But it's, um, it depends on how DIY handy you are. I think um, it's certainly possible to work with a group like Interglass um, to have them manufacture storm windows and then you install them yourselves. Um, but at the same time, it's a pretty big investment. So you have to weigh, again, um, your, your sort of risk tolerance on that. Um, if you're looking at something like an exterior wood storm window, go for it. Um, but with some of these more pressure fit um, custom models, I would defer to the to the company um, and and see what they recommend specifically based on your house. Uh, the next one is a clarification. Are we looking for a higher or a lower hers number? Lower hers is better. Higher hers number means you're using more energy um, in the house. And what was the R in hers? Oh goodness, let me, let me pull that up in my notes. I'm blanking on it off the top of my head. Home energy something. <laughs> Home energy something standard. Uh. <laughs> Give me just a second here. Sure. <laughs> I'll invite anyone to put any other questions in the Q&A. Home uh, energy rating system. Rating system. <laughs> Any other questions for Carissa before we wrap up tonight? I 
I think we may be all set. Well, if you all feel inspired uh, after this, realize that there's something that you you had to ask um, and, and didn't want to ask it in, in this session, you can also feel free um, to email me. Uh, it's my first initial and last name, C-D-E-M-O-R-E, at historicnewengland.org. Um, and we are always happy to field questions about energy efficiency. So feel free uh, to shoot me an email if something comes to mind. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to our participants as well. We will post the video or the um, the presentation on Facebook. So for anyone who is late or who wants to share this with family and friends, you'll have an opportunity to do that. But I thank you all for coming out tonight, and I especially thank for, uh, Carissa for joining us. It's very interesting. Excellent. Happy to. All thank right. You so thank much. you all so much. Good night.